Hello Year 8. Before we make a start on today's lesson, there are three questions for you to do now. One of them is a challenge, and the first two questions I hope all of you can do those. So have a go and pause the video now. For question number one, you have to try to recall as much as you can remember about the way that solid particles, liquid particles and gas particles are arranged. So when you think of solid particles, you should be able to recall that they are very, very tightly packed together. They are very close together and they are in a regular pattern. Also, they vibrate about a fixed position and they are incompressible, very, very difficult to squash, almost impossible. Okay, so hopefully you were using those sentences, you would come up with words like regular, incompressible, fixed, and vibrate. In terms of liquids, they are also very close together, the particles there, uh, except that they can move around and uh, slide over each other, so they can basically flow. They can take the shape of the container that they're in, and they move around randomly and also are very very difficult to compress so we can say that they are incompressible and that should give you some words like flow incompressible close and random now as for gases gases uh, the particles are very very far apart they are randomly arranged they move very very quickly so fast in all directions with high energy so for high energy we can use the word energetic Okay, uh, as for question number two, you just needed to draw how the particles are arranged in the three states, and the pictures are there for you. And for the challenge, you'd have to try to describe what is meant by gas pressure. So if we imagine, um, if you watch the National Lottery sometimes, and so you see the lottery balls smashing about uh, in a container, or smashing around in a container, so we can imagine these uh, lottery balls as gas particles okay in this closed container they're moving around at very very high speeds they are often colliding with each other as well as the walls of the container with some force okay so the gas is basically pushing on something usually this uh, the container walls now the more that they are hitting uh, the container the faster they are moving so the more often that they are actually hitting the container uh, that means that they are traveling faster okay and if that is the case then we say that these uh, particles have a higher pressure the faster that they travel okay um, this is why for example if you look at a tire or a balloon uh, the pressure goes up when we uh, push more air particles or pump or blow more air particles uh, inside of that uh, of those containers Okay, so this lesson is a combination of uh, quite a big chunk of P3. It's covering P3 in the Activate books from P3.4 to 3.6. We're looking at pressure in solids, liquids, and gases. Okay, so the learning objectives for this lesson they are to be able to describe the factors that affect gas pressure and how atmospheric pressure changes with height. Then we move on to looking at uh, describing how liquid pressure changes with depth and how things uh, float, whereas other things sink. Finally, you should be able to calculate pressure and apply ideas of pressure in different situations. Now we will introduce gas pressure. So in this diagram, we have a picture of a balloon and the little circles here represent the air particles and the arrows on those circles represent the particles in constant motion. So they're constantly flying around in different directions, all very random, banging against the sides of the balloon, the inside surface of the balloon. They are of course, exerting a force on the balloon, and that's what keeps the balloon inflated and firm. The more gas I have in the balloon, the more pressure it exerts on the balloon. So if you think, for example, of an aerosol can, 
maybe a deodorant can. It has so much gas inside of it banging against the can itself that it has to be made of metal because if it was made of anything uh, less durable and strong, then it could easily explode. Okay, because the particles inside an aerosol can are so energetic. Okay, um, so I've highlighted here in capital letters that these gas particles are moving in all directions. So the pressure is being exerted as well in all directions. Here we have two containers. Okay. They've got the same amount of gas particles. If you count them, you'll see that there are 11 uh, in both of these cylinders. In reality, there will be billions of particles there. But let's just imagine we've got the same amount of uh, gas particles there. The one on the right has a smaller volume, OK, as we can see, compared to the one on the left. Since the space in the smaller one on the right is uh, less, um, there are more collisions on the wall of those gas particles. They are uh, colliding with the wall more often than the cylinder on the left. OK. So basically, if you look at the cylinder on the right, it will have a higher pressure because of more collisions by those particles. OK, so if you make the volume of the cylinder smaller, you also increase the pressure of the gas. Another important factor, apart from changing the volume of the container, which has the gas in it, another factor that can affect the gas pressure is also change of temperature. So if you heat up gas particles and increase the temperature in a container, it makes the particles move really, really fast so that uh, when they strike the container walls, they do so with a much bigger force. So the pressure gets bigger. Okay, It can actually cause the container to expand or in some cases even explode. When we force lots of air particles into a small space like the tires of a bike, we are basically compressing the gas into that space. Its molecules are striking the container walls more often. So adding more molecules also means that they have less space inside of that tire to move. So they collide more often with the tire walls. And this, of course, builds up the pressure inside of the tire. So compressed gases are usually under very, very high pressures. All around us, we have lots and lots and millions of billions of air particles. OK and they are pushing on us. They're also pushing on everything else. And this is what we call atmospheric pressure. So now if we go to the top of a mountain, there isn't as much air around at that height compared to if we were at sea level, OK? Because the force of gravity is pulling the air molecules down. So there isn't that much air when we're on the top of a mountain, especially if you went to a mountain like uh, Mount Everest, the tallest in the world, the air is very, very thin over there. OK, and that is why you often see people who are attempting to climb those mountains carrying oxygen uh, in tanks with them, because there just isn't enough oxygen in the air for them to breathe in. So they need this supplementary amount uh, with them. So the atmospheric pressure basically decreases as you go higher and higher above sea level. Now we move on to liquid pressure. So if you have any object that's immersed in water, the pressure on that object is basically due to all of the water molecules that are constantly colliding with it. This pressure, again, is exerted in all directions, as you can see on the diagram. As we've already uh, looked at in the past, the liquids themselves are not able to be compressed. And that is because the particles in the liquid are really, really close to each other. They're touching each other. And so there's literally no space 
between them for you to be able to compress that liquid. Okay, so you cannot decrease the volume of a liquid. Remember that when we were talking about atmospheric pressure, uh, we said that as you increase the height above sea level, the pressure decreases. Uh, when we're talking about pressure in uh, liquids such as water, if we go uh, deeper, so the depth increases, what we find is that the pressure gets much, much bigger. So if you ever have a chance to see a dam, what you should normally find is that the bottom of the wall of a dam uh, further down, so in greater depth, is a lot thicker than the wall uh, further up in the shallow part of the uh, water. So because the pressure at the bottom is a lot bigger than the pressure at the top. An object that is completely or just partly submerged in a liquid experiences a greater pressure on its bottom surface than on its top surface. There's a smaller weight of water pushing down on the top surface. Now, the bigger pressure on the lower surface is there because it's deeper, so there's a bigger weight of water pushing down on it. This difference in pressure on the upper and lower surfaces of the object causes an overall upward force, which we call upthrust. If you drop an object, into a liquid, let's say you drop an ice cube into water, you can see that the water level rises. And in general, with liquids, when you add an object or drop an object into a liquid, we generally see a rise in the liquid level. This rise in liquid level, we call it the displaced liquid. Okay? The upthrust is basically equal to the weight of liquid that is displaced by the object. If upthrust is bigger than the weight of the object, then it floats. If the upthrust is smaller than the weight of the object, then it will sink. And if the weight equals the upthrust, then the object floats, just as in the example over here that's given with the boat showing an upthrust of 40,000 newtons and the weight of the boat of 40,000 newtons downwards. Okay, now if an object is light, it doesn't need to sink far into the liquid until it displaces enough liquid to equal its own weight. If the object is denser or heavier than that lighter object, then it needs to sink to a slightly deeper level into the liquid until the upthrust is big enough to equal the weight of the object. If the object itself is denser or even more heavier than the liquid itself that it's uh, been dropped into, then it is unable to displace enough liquid to make upthrust equal to the object's weight, and so it will sink. And that's a little bit about floating and sinking. So in this diagram, we have an object that is uh, submerged completely underwater. And basically what happens is that the pressure on this object's top surface is different to the pressure on the bottom surface of that same object. This is because there is more weight of all the water molecules on the bottom surface than there is on the top surface. Uh, so as an object moves deeper and deeper underwater, the weight of water increases and there'll be more and more water above it. So the overall pressure on the object does increase, but there's a difference between the pressure on the top surface compared to the bottom surface. And this difference is the upthrust and it's always more pressure on the bottom. And here's another diagram, which is imagining a can of beans also thrown into submerged in some water. And you can see here that the greater pressure is on the bottom surface of the can of beans compared to the weaker pressure on the top. Here we have a picture of a person standing on a concrete surface. So they're exerting a force, which is the weight 
of themselves onto the concrete and thankfully they are not giving a big enough providing a big enough force to cause them to sink if we then replace the concrete surface with a much softer surface such as mud the pressure caused by the weight of yourself will cause your feet to sink however if you spread out your weight you will actually find that you won't sink as deeply now pressure is defined as a measure of how much force is applied over a certain area so there's an equation that you need to know and that equation is pressure is equal to force which is measured in newtons divided by the area which is measured in meters squared and the unit for pressure is newtons per meter squared sometimes there's an alternative unit for pressure as well which is called pascals but you're going to be mainly working with newtons per meter squared now there's a formula triangle as well which i've just uh, put up on the screen now if you want to find for example the pressure you put your finger or thumb over the pressure and it tells you that you are left with the force divided by the area and if you want to find the force you can cover your finger over force and that tells you that the force is given by multiplying the pressure by the area let's take a look at an example of a type of um, thing that you could be asked in an exam so we're going to compare the pressures of two different pieces of footwear okay a pair of uh, football boots and a pair of uh, trainers okay and it's uh, giving you an indication here that the area of the football boots is much much smaller compared the to the area of the trainer for example okay so there's the trainer there we have the football boots with the studs at the bottom now it's given to us that the area of these studs for the pair of football boots the total area of all the studs added together is 20 centimeters squared the area of the two trainers or a pair of trainers is given to us as 200 centimeters squared so clearly the trainer has a much greater uh, surface area that is in contact with the let's say the ground okay compared to the football studs now we're given the force of the person who would be wearing these uh, pieces of footwear and this is given as the weight 600 newtons so because we've got the area and we've got the force we can use our pressure equation to calculate the pressure exerted by the studs and compare it to the pressure exerted by the trainers worn by the same person so use our equation pressure is equal to force divided by area the force is uh, weight 600 newtons divided by the 20 centimeters squared and that gives us the pressure for the studs of 30 newtons per centimeter squared if we take the pressure is equal to force divided by area and work out the pressure for the trainers we get 600 newtons divided by 200 centimeters squared which gives us a much smaller pressure of three newtons per centimeter squared so the interesting thing that we can take from this is to, and we can use a different analogy if you were to lie on a bed of nails and you might have seen don't try this at home though but you might have seen people doing that um, they are able to do it for a quite a period of time without seeming to be in great pain and that is because the area of all those nails is quite big okay and the weight of the person lying on them that's the same so if we do the same thing we've got the same person on just a single nail okay because the area now of just one nail is much smaller than a bed of nails you will see that the same weight that person that's lying on top of that one nail that's going to be a much much greater pressure and it's going to hurt a lot more than in that nicely distributed bed of nails.